Hello, everybody. Ooh, yay, the sound is working. Uh, so hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Van Gelder. I am VP Engineering at Spring Health, which is a little startup in New York that's all about removing the barriers to accessing mental health care. I've been in tech for about 20 years now. Uh, first as an engineer, then as a tech lead, then as a manager, then as a VP. Here are a few of the companies I have worked at along the way. And there's something that they all have in common. And that is pretty soon after I get to a new company, someone from the leadership team pulls me to one side and says, how do we instill a sense of urgency into the team? And really what they're asking is, why is our pace of delivery so slow? Why is it taking so long to get things done? Is there something wrong with our architecture? Is there something wrong with our tech stack? Is there something wrong with our engineers? Do they not know what they're doing? Do they not care what they're doing? And spoiler, it's usually not the engineers. There's normally something else going on on your team. So what do you do to a piece of software when it's slow? You debug it. What do you do when a team is slow? I would give you the same answer. So this talk, I'm going to tell stories about times when I debugged teams at three companies. That's Bauer Excel Media, Stride, and Meetup. And probably the first question you're asking is like, what the hell is Bauer Excel Media? It's basically the biggest magazine publishing company you have never heard of. You've never heard of them, right? Uh, they're like Condé Nast. They have 600 magazines, 100 TV and radio stations worldwide. In New York, they had brands like Life and Style, In Touch, Women's Weekly. And I was brought in to see what was wrong with the New York tech team. The New York tech team was the most expensive but least performing out of all the Bauer Excel teams globally. Velocity was going down sprint by sprint. The engineers were coming in late. They were leaving early. There were literally times during the sprint when no one knew where the whole team was or what they were working on. And they weren't answering emails or Slack. So I joined. Uh, I've actually joined to ask, is, is there something wrong with the engineers? So the leadership team was asking me basically, like, should we fire all the engineers? Because they're not motivated, right? So I started debugging the team. I went to all the ceremonies. I went to sprint planning, to grooming, <laughs> went to retros. I paired with the engineers. And I realized pretty quickly there was something interesting happening at sprint planning. The scrum master told me he wanted to hold the engineers accountable for getting their work done. At the end of every sprint, there was always a big pile of stories that weren't finished. It was really irritating to him. So his idea was to say that every engineer at sprint planning would sign up to which stories they personally would complete. And if they didn't complete them by the end of the sprint, they had to justify why in front of the whole team and their manager. The engineers hated this. They felt blamed. And bear in mind that sometimes the reason for not finishing a story was actually beyond their control. It could be they're waiting on another team, another person, a third party. It didn't matter. They're told to be scrappy, to push through it, and get it done anyway. So what did they do? They started padding their estimates. The engineers took on less and less work every sprint because they wanted to make damn sure that they could get their stories finished. They didn't have to explain why. Uh, sprints went from Monday to Friday. By Thursday, most engineers had actually finished their work for the sprint, but they didn't want to say that to either the product manager or the scrum master because there was a danger they could be given a story they wouldn't be able to complete by Friday. So what did they do? They hid around the building, and they didn't answer Slack. So in other words, something that was put in place to increase team performance, to really encourage engineers to get more work done every sprint, had completely the opposite effect. It tanked velocity. I like talking about debugging teams. This framework is a really useful framework for thinking about how to approach debugging your team. It comes from this book called Drive by Daniel Pink. It's actually about individual human motivation, but I think it maps really nicely to team motivation. Like usually when your team is doing something surprising or unexpected, it is down to a lack of one or more of these things. And they are mastery. That is, does a team have the skills needed to do their job well? Is the path to promotion clear? Autonomy. Uh, how much control do teams have over how they solve problems? Purpose. Is it clear why teams are working on things? 
Does everything ladder up to a real common goal for the company? And lastly, safety. This actually isn't in the book. This is something that I added. This comes from Google's research into high-performing teams. <coughs> Google did a ton of research as to, into what makes some teams perform better than others. They looked at everything from like personality to skill sets. And in the end, what it came down to, according to them, was psychological safety. And that makes sense, right? If you don't feel safe, you're not going to try to go for stretch goals. If you don't feel safe, you're going to cover your ass. Oh, doesn't that seem familiar from Bar Excel? Let's come talk about how I introduced change to the team. But first, a quick note about measuring, because things like a pace of delivery and speed are really subjective. And if you can't measure them and you introduce change, it's really hard to know whether the change that you, that you have introduced actually works. My favorite way of measuring pace of delivery is cycle time. That is, the time between an engineer starting to work on a story and it being live in production. And I love it because there is nowhere to hide. If it takes an engineer two days to get a story done, but then it takes three days for that story to get deployed to production, then, ooh, that's a good bottleneck you can investigate as a team. A lot of people like using velocity as a measurement of pace of delivery. The trouble is that velocity can be gamed. Many years ago, I had a stakeholder who was really unimpressed with how many points my team was doing every sprint. We were getting 10 points of work done. So I said, no problem. I told my team, we're going to times every estimate by 10. So a three-point estimate became a 30-point estimate. Overnight, my team went from doing 10 points a sprint to 100 points a sprint. Stakeholder thrilled, much more impressive. It was the same amount of work. <laughs> Uh, good news is that if you use a Jira or Pivotal Tracker, cycle time is already calculated for you. You can just use it. Cool. So now we can measure pace of delivery. So how to apply the drive framework to Bower Excel? So first of all, Bower had a safety problem. Engineers felt blamed if they didn't get a story done. And usually the first thing you have to do if there's a safety problem is remove the safety problem. Because if engineers feel unsafe, it's really hard to motivate them to do anything else. So in this case, it was simple. We ended the concept of tracking individual velocity. We said, it doesn't matter if you don't complete your stories at the end of a sprint. It's most important that we track team velocity. We start to get as many stories done as we possibly can over that time. And then I said, great. Uh, now, let's look at cycle time and see how we can reduce it. And my team said, why? Like, honestly, what does it matter if we goof off a little bit on Friday afternoons? Like, who cares? The answer was, it actually cared hugely. Uh, Bauer was in the online advertising, sorry, Bauer got its revenue from online advertising. Uh, they used Facebook to effectively uh, paid acquisition. So they paid for eyeballs on their stories. Facebook just changed their algorithm, which meant it was suddenly much, much, much more expensive for us to get eyeballs on our stories. If we didn't figure out another way of attracting users to our stories or other ways of getting online advertising revenue, the whole office in New York was actually at risk. But no one had told that to my team. They didn't want to worry them. So I sat down with my team. I had a frank and difficult discussion about uh, actually what was going on with the revenue. And I literally linked all the stories we were working on to the company goals and how much revenue we had to do to keep the office open. It was scary. But now the engineers actually understood why we had to get work done and what the real sense of urgency was from the company. And now we started to look at cycle time and started to track our bottlenecks. And we actually found one pretty quickly. So we weren't assigning uh, individual owners to stories anymore. But what we're, what we're still doing was assigning people to own certain parts of the code base. The idea was that every engineer would have like a part of the code base that they were the expert on and only they would make changes in it. And this makes sense, right? Because if you, know that, if you know that part of the code base really well, then you're able to make changes much more quickly with a good architecture. Uh, the trouble is sometimes you want to make changes, you want to make a lot of changes to one part of the code, but only one person can do them. So hey, bottleneck. Uh, plus, what happens if that specific human is, say, on vacation, if they get sick? What happens if, God forbid, they leave? Now you have a real problem. So we said that instead of assigning people to own parts of the code base, every engineer should pick up the next story in the backlog. All the stories were just in priority order. And we said, well, if you pick up something on an area that you're not really so sure about, pair. So pair with someone else who knows the area a lot better. 
short term, again, did not do good things for velocity. We're pairing a lot. People are working on different areas of the code. But long term, it dramatically increased it and also decreased the number of silos on our team. And also had another really great side effect. Uh, back in the world of individual velocity, when holding people accountable for how much work they personally were doing, there were no incentives for seniors to pair with juniors, because if a senior took time away from their story to help someone else, it might hurt them later if they didn't get it done. Uh, but now in this world of pairing, where we said it's much more important for the whole team to get work done, suddenly seniors are pairing with juniors, uh, knowledge is flowing amongst the team. So I talked about juniors and seniors, but that was actually a sore point for Bauer. Uh, when I got there, there was no skills matrix. There was no definition of what it meant to be a junior, mid, or senior engineer. And as a result, there were some people who had just finished a boot camp who had the title of senior engineer, and they were making some pretty big architectural decisions that they really didn't have the experience for. Things that should have been really simple ended up being wildly overcomplicated and taking much too long. I knew that when I came in. I'd been warned by people on the leadership team. They didn't think that some people were really as senior as their title said. But I put off making changes as long as I could because, ooh, taking titles away really messes with safety. I wanted to get some quick wins from the team first to win some trust with cycle time. But eventually, we had to get another project that was wildly overcomplicated and really late. So I knew the time had come, and I had to level the team. So we introduced a skills matrix. That is a definition of what it means to be a junior, mid, senior engineer, and all, all the way up to director. It's not just tech skills. Um, other things are in there as well. For example, collaboration and mentoring. It's really important to me that seniors don't just stay in a corner, but actually help others grow as well. We introduced the skills matrix. I leveled the team. Titles changed. Salaries changed. Some people left. But the ones who stayed were grateful. The seniors were grateful because their seniority was actually recognized. It's actually really demotivating if you're a senior with 10 years experience to watch someone come in with a fraction of your years and expertise and get the same title and salary as you. And the juniors were grateful because finally there was a path to career progression. Before then, there was nothing really motivating them to learn. They didn't know what they had to do to get promoted. So like, hey, like, why bother? Whereas now there was actually a clear path both to track where they were right now and also what they had to learn to get to the next level. I've talked a bit about some change I introduced. I'm going to take a step back for a minute and talk about the change toolkit that I used or how I introduced change to a team. And first of all, note that every team is different. So you really have to approach every team with fresh eyes and understand from the team what problems there are to solve. Here are some of the ways I do that. First of all, Whenever I join a new team, I come in and ask a set of open questions to everyone on the team. That would be uh, stakeholders, product managers, uh, engineering leaders, tech leads, architects, every engineer on the team, designers. I ask the same question of everybody, including my favorite, which is, if you had a magic wand and you could change anything at your company, what would you change? Interesting thing about this is, A, like you, see what, you see what people's main pain points are, but you can also start to track trends. Like, is everyone worried about the same things? Something I often see would be things like the leaders of the team, that could be like the tech leaders worried about pace of delivery, but the engineers worried about bugs or tech debt. So it gives you like good places to dig in. Uh, pair programming is a fantastic way to actually see what's going on um, amongst the engineers on the team themselves. So I will try to pair with engineers as much as I can. Some of the things that I look out for would be uh, how clear is it to the engineer what they have to do for the story? Do I have to get permission from somebody to make changes? Uh, how long does it take to run through the CI-CD pipeline? How, how hard is it to deploy? How much are they interrupted as part of the team? <coughs> Retros are also a fantastic way to see what's going on in the team. You literally ask your team, like, what are your pain points? And the team will tell you it's brilliant. And uh, because it's their pain points, they are super motivated to come up with ideas to help you solve those problems. Uh, note, though, it's pretty easy to run a bad retro. I'm sure all of us have been in those, too. Uh, a bad retro is a bit like therapy. Like you go, you have a bit of a vent, but nothing really changes. A retro is only useful if it has actual action items that come out of it, 
the team can see it as a useful tool for change. So it's really important to have action items and to make sure you have follow through and things actually change as a result of it. It's also only useful if you are really talking about the pain points of the whole team, not just some key influences like the tech lead. That's why I love doing things like voting to make sure they really are talking about the top things of the whole team. And it's also important to get the voice of the whole team. Again, if someone influential like tech lead is the only person speaking, you're not really getting the whole team working with you on fixing the problems. Cool. So now I have some idea about what's going on with the team. Uh, here are some ways I'll actually implement the changes. First of all, Namawashi, which is the informal process of quietly laying the foundation for some proposed change or project by talking to the people concerned, gathering support and feedback. Or in other words, I never go into a big change cold. Before introducing something, I'll always talk to like the main stakeholders and influencers on a team to make sure that they are behind the change I'm trying to introduce. Uh, example at Bauer, when I introduced the skills matrix, I also introduced a performance management program, which had never happened before, I introduced a 360 feedback to everybody and smart goals. I introduced smart goals first to the team cynic, that is the person who told me that smart goals were useless and he would never do them. Uh, he was one of my key bottlenecks on the team, one of the most super senior engineers. He spent all of his time solving problems for other people. He had a real hard time getting his own work done. So I set goals with him all about knowledge sharing, about teaching other people how to solve problems so he wasn't always interrupted. He loved that. And then when it came to introduce smart goals to the rest of the team, the team cynic spoke up and said, actually, like, I thought these things were useless, but Lisa did those with me and they were kind of fine. And that really helped the rest of the team get buy-in for those smart goals. Change is really scary when it is done to you as opposed to something that you feel that you can change. So as much as possible, I try to give engineers the power to control the change. Example with the skills matrix again, when I introduced it, every engineer at Bauer was able to give feedback on the skills matrix and to help define their own level before it was used to level them. Similarly, they controlled the timeline. They told me they wanted a grace period of three months. So if someone was leveled as like below their current title, say they had title of senior, but we leveled them as ah, probably a mid, they would have three months to work with their manager to put goals together to see if they could keep their current title. Kaizens are another way, another great way of letting teams control the change. Kaizens are small experiments that lead to continual improvement. So when I want to change something, I'll set the direction I want the team to go in, but not what they have to do to change. So at Bauer, I said I wanted to reduce our cycle time by 50%. Uh, cycle time when I got there was about 15 days. I think about 15 days to get one story on average to production. I said once reduce that by 50%. That's a pretty big gap. A Kaizen is like one small experiment to reduce it. So every sprint, I challenge the team to like, think, of, think of one small thing that can reduce cycle time by, say, 10%. And gradually, those small changes add up to the big improvement that you want to do. Uh, change works best when people are honest with me about what works and when, what doesn't. So whenever I can, I will reward hard feedback. I will publicly thank the person for what they said, if they're open to it and say what I'll do differently as a result of the feedback. The idea of the grace period was one of those. Uh, someone came to me and said that the whole team was really freaked out about the leveling process, and that having a grace period would help them, help them know that they wouldn't be suddenly leveled like overnight. So I thanked that person for it about the team meeting. I'm gonna make mistakes. I try a lot, it doesn't always work. And as a leader, people look to you to see how you cope when something goes wrong. So as much as possible, I will get, I will get up there in front of the whole team and say, yeah, I messed up this thing, but here's what I learned out of it. Uh, example from Bauer, I removed one of the key quality engineering processes from the release because I was so focused on reducing cycle time. And the result of that was that a whole bunch of new bugs went into production. So I got up front of the whole team and went like that. That was a mistake. In hindsight, obviously, I should have done that. Okay, so end result. After all the changes at Bauer, uh, so we introduced the skills matrix, we leveled the team, we ended the individual assignment of stories, individual velocity, we introduced pairing, we ended the idea of people having owners, ownership over a specific part of the code. 
Cycle time went from 15 days to less than one. Uh, Bauer actually met their financial goals. The office didn't close. And uh, I was happy. One of the big things that I learned at Bauer is that you can't have autonomy without mastery. So if you have a bunch of folks on the team who really don't have the skills and expertise to do their job, and you just let them run, it's not going to end well. It doesn't take very many people to derail a team, especially if those people are like key influencers or senior, people like tech leads or architects. So I've learned not to take those titles for granted. Uh, when I come into a new job, I will actually like, evaluate folks to see, like, hey, do they actually have the skills needed to do their job? And I'll take quick action if I need to. So I was happy about it. I'd done a lot. But then a friend of mine came to me and said that there's this interesting new consultancy company that was starting called Stride, which is all about debugging teams. You may realize that debugging teams is kind of one of the things I love to do the most. This was a chance for me to go run teams of consultants who went to do this. They're like Pivotal, if you've heard of them, uh, except that instead of going to Pivotal, uh, Striders went to the company. They embed on the team, pair with companies, and make them better. Or oh, they're like ThoughtWorks, but without the travel. Yeah. So I joined Stride. As a VP Engineering, mostly I was running teams of consultants as opposed to personally going to an engagement. But this next story I'm going to tell is actually a disaster story, which is a story when I had to go to engagement because it was not going well. So we had a client, I'm going to call them Acme Call, who were threatening to fire Stride as a client. Uh, the project was late. We said that we were going to release something in three months. It was now six months later and it was nowhere near being released. The client didn't just say that we were late, they also said that the engineers that we had sent didn't know how to write code, and that we had oversold the skill set of our team, which is the last thing you want to hear if you're a consultancy. So I knew the engineers, I knew this wasn't true. So uh, because this was an important client, I went in to debug the team and to see what was happening. So similar to Bauer, I went in, I shouted the ceremonies, uh, I paired with the engineers. And the first thing that I found was there was a real big problem with autonomy. Uh, the project was late. Uh, the client engineers told us that they had already decided the implementation of all of the stories. They just mapped it all out for us. And my team just needed to do what we had been told. Like, there wasn't time to rethink anything. My folks were not happy about that. This is the code. It's a big pile of spaghetti. No one understood it. There were no tests. The client engineers said there was no time to write tests. And honestly, like with that big pile of spaghetti, it would have been really hard to write any kind of tests for it. Uh, the servers were pets, not cattle. That is, that every server had like slightly different versions of things running on it. And deployment was manual, so we had to like manually copy over files we wanted to deploy. Uh, the result of all that was that deploying was really hairy. Every time we deployed to production, there were a slew of new interesting bugs that came out. And our stakeholder, the one who had brought us into the project, was furious. He said that all the bugs meant that my engineers did not know how to code. We had a stakeholder. He had a set of requirements for us. Every time we met him, the requirements changed a little bit. And he was also really busy. So we had demo meetings, but he didn't come. So we did the best that we could. We built the thing that we thought he wanted. Uh, but you can kind of see where this is going, right? When Lee finally came to demo, and looked at our product, he was furious and said we were idiots, had no idea what we were doing, and we had built the wrong thing. So at this point, my team is pretty much flipping tables. Uh, not only is the client threatening to fire us, but all my striders are also threatening to quit. They feel like they're being blamed here, they're being blamed for the spaghetti code with a complete lack of tests. Uh, you might be wondering like, why they're blaming my engineers rather than the client engineers. Well, before we got there, there had never been a release, so they couldn't compare code with us to without us, because they'd never actually seen the thing work. But nevertheless, we got all the blame for it. So I knew that we had to do something to turn this around. So the engagement manager and I went to our stakeholder's boss, and we told him 
But unless we got access to the users who are actually building this product for, they might as well fire us because there was no way we were actually going to build anything that was useful for them or for the company. Uh, luckily, our stakeholders boss agreed. He put us in touch with the users. We're building an internal tool for users as part of the company. Those internal users were thrilled. No one had ever come to talk to them before. Now here we turned up, like we shadowed them, we actually saw what they were doing day by day and understood like the pain points. They came to our demos, they gave us feedback, and the requirements stopped changing because we literally had users now in our demos uh, making sure what we're building was the right thing for them. When our stakeholder finally came to a demo, I was a bit worried he was gonna get angry with us, uh, but luckily he was actually really thrilled to see the users there because he was so super busy that he realized that he didn't have to spend time on us. The users were there giving us the feedback that we needed. We had to do something around all the bugs happening in production. It was genuinely too hard to add unit tests given the spaghetti code on, on the system. So we introduced some really basic Selenium tests that could do like full end-to-end -end tests that gave us confidence like the main user journeys through the site were working. Ran them manually. There was no way to automatically deploy at this point. The client engineers initially thought we were wasting our time, like how can tests possibly help? But after a few releases that were a lot less hairy than they had been, at least like the main things worked, they started to trust us. They asked us if they could pair with us and see like how, how to write those end-to-end -end tests. We were really thrilled. And then they asked us, hmm, we're thinking about doing these things for the next set of stories. Like maybe we could start to talk through with you like how we might solve those problems. My team finally started to get some autonomy back. The project was late. Nothing we could do about that. It was already late by the time that we got there. But the next version wasn't. And not only did we not get fired, the client actually asked us to build the next version of, of, a, of a product for a different set of internal users. We said we wouldn't do that unless we could write it test first from the beginning. And they said, fantastic, like, pair with us. Show us how to write tests. My striders got burned out. At least half the team asked to leave that client at that point. They were just done. I got a fresh set of, set of striders in. They were super enthused. They paired with the engineers. And the next set of, of work done for that client was all done test first. So, yay. Uh, things that I learned from that client you can't have autonomy without purpose. So my riders were actually so focused on not having any autonomy in how to solve the problems that they kind of missed that the client engineers didn't know what problem they were solving, and they really didn't know which users they were solving that problem for. So I've learned not to take that for granted either. One of the first things I'll do when I go to a new team is ask everyone on the team, like, what, what problem are you solving? Which users are you solving it for? Just to make sure that everyone on the team like, has the same understanding of what it is they're working on and why. So I love my time at Stride. Uh, but the thing that I loved the most was debugging teams. And mostly at Stride, other than Acme Call, which was fun, I was mostly running teams of consultants who were fixing problems. But I didn't get to be hands-on myself very much at the clients. And I kind of missed it. So when I met up with a friend of mine, she told me about uh, her job at Meetup with having big problems with pace of delivery. And I thought, ah, I know this one. Like, I can go in and help. So I shifted company again, and I went to join Meetup. Meetup brought me in to solve two things. One of them was introduce a sense of urgency to the team. Uh, they told me that they felt like they really had to push engineers to release. And they just didn't seem to want to ship new software. There was also a huge amount of problems with quality. Uh, every time Meetup did a release, a slew of new bugs went out to production. The teams didn't seem to care about quality. Uh, bugs were live for months, sometimes years. Meetup celebrated bug birthdays. <laughs> the users were not happy. The leadership team was not happy. And they wondered why the team didn't seem to care to fix those things. So I joined Meetup. I started debugging the teams. And the first question I asked engineers there was, um, how do you decide when something is ready to release? Like when something is good enough, of good enough quality to release? And they said, oh, let me tell you about the top five. So there were nine product engineering teams. I made up that as nine feature teams. Every Monday, every team had to put forward at least one feature they could release by Friday. The leadership team chose five of those teams, became the top five, the top five features. 
if those five teams did not release their feature by Friday, they were publicly shamed in front of the whole company. So Meetup was effectively running a fire drill. Teams never got a chance to like, take a step back, to look at tech debt, to look at bugs, uh, because if they didn't release that feature on Friday, irrespective of if it worked or not, they are going to get shamed in front of the whole company. So Meetup had a safety problem. The first thing you have to do when you have a safety problem is remove the safety problem. Uh, so we enter the top five. We shifted instead to objectives and key results, which teams controlled. So teams decided like what and when they were going to launch. And because I'm a big believer that you get what you measure, one of those OKRs was all around uh, quality, that is the number of bugs in production. Uh, when I got there, we had over 100 critical, major, and important bugs. I wanted to get the time a lot more. It turns out that teams cared hugely about quality and number of bugs. They weren't really sad with how many bugs were, were in production. They hadn't had a chance to fix them before. So now we set Kaizen's uh, small experiments. I challenged every team to like, think of different ways you can get that bug count down. There were a whole bunch of smart ideas. Uh, one of them was introduced uh, flow type to React. So we had some type safety that stopped a whole bunch of really interesting type bugs. But we still had a lot of operational incidents and fires that were actually pretty awful for our users. So I went to Meetup and I asked, uh, how does on-call work at Meetup? Like, who, who's on-call when things go wrong? And they told me that there was a really small set of engineers who were on call for the code written by everybody else. Think five people on call for the code written by 70. And that was done to protect the feature teams. So in the world of the top five, if you have to release something every Friday and something goes wrong in production, you don't have time to stop, to like stop and fix that thing. So there's a separate team that was going to fix the problems in production. Makes sense, right? The trouble is that it breaks the virtuous alerting cycle. So this is my terrible diagram of the virtuous alerting cycle. Uh, something goes wrong in production. A team is alerted. The team fixes the problem. Hopefully, the team then takes a step back, looks at the quality and stability of the system, as well as the alerts themselves, makes some improvements. Team gets alerted less. Hooray, everyone wins, right? But we broke that at Meetup because a different team was woken up at 2 in the morning than the team that was writing the code to ship those new features. So team two didn't really have any incentive to improve the quality or stability of the system because team one was going to get woken up at two in the morning when something went wrong. You might wonder, like, hey, well, why doesn't team one just improve the systems? Well, team one was also on call for the code of eight other teams. So they didn't really have the time to improve any of the systems because they were just continually fighting fires and just trying to stay above water. So the fix for this was to introduce pager duty. I put every engineer at Meetup on call, including me. I was on a rotation as well. Uh, every team was on call for the code and services that they owned and operated. So I went to an engineer all hands and went, good news, you're all on call now. <coughs> they were not so thrilled. They were kind of worried. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't want to be on call. They were actually afraid that something would go wrong at 2 in the morning and they wouldn't know how to fix it. So the first thing that we did was introduce on-call training. We did incident response training with the idea that uh, the, the first responder does not have to solve the issue. They have to triage, have to see, like, is this really an actual thing, and then alert the right person to fix it. And I also got those 70 engineers who had not been on call before to pair with the five who had through like, real incidents for a few times. So they got the experience to see what actually happened before they were on call themselves for the first time. So now, finally, Quality is getting more under control at Meetup. The number of critical, major, and important bugs in production went down from 100 to 10. The amount of incidents in production went down from like multiple times a day. So like, that could be a month sometimes, but nothing went wrong. It was great. So now we could shift to looking at cycle time. And similar to quality, I set Kaizen's with the team. I said we wanted to reduce cycle time. Cycle time when I got to Meetup was really high. It was about 30 days. And this is an environment of continuous delivery, so and con con continuous deployment. So whenever an engineer checked in their code to master, it went to production automatically after going through a set of automated tests. But it was still taking about 30 days on average to ship one story. So we set Kaizen's. Dean's came up with a whole bunch of interesting ideas for how to improve it, including changing the way that PRs worked, 
Initially, when I got there, engineers were told not to interrupt their stories to finish someone else's PR. They should wait until the end. So PRs were waiting, sometimes like two, three days before being looked at. We said instead people should interrupt their work. It's much more important to get that one story all the way through to production. So that definitely helped. The cycle time was still really high. So I paired with engineers, and I found subtasks. Uh, stories that made up were really big, what they called a story, I would call an epic. And to ensure that engineers uh, wrote code that adhered to good architectural standards, the way that it worked was that senior engineers would take one of these huge stories, decide on the implementation, break the story into subtasks, and assign the subtasks out to different engineers. A couple of problems with that. Hands up if you love being given implementation rather than a problem. No? No one likes that. It's very demotivational. Plus, everyone is given a small piece of the puzzle. And because they're not given the whole problem, they can't take a step back and think, like, maybe there's a better way to actually solve this problem than this implementation that the senior came up with. But they, they were not told to solve the problem, just implementing this one small portion of it. So the fix to this was to end subtasks. We said that the engineer who picked up a story should decide on the implementation. And sure, they should run that implementation past a senior person, senior engineer, an architect, etc. But it was up to them to decide how to solve it. And we ended subtasks completely. So, end result of meetup. After two years, the, the number of critical, major, and important bugs in production went down from over 100 to less than 10. Cycle time went down from 30 days to five. The work to improve meetup continues. I'm not there anymore, sadly. My main learning from Meetup was uh, sometimes you need outside help. So I talked about ending the top five like it was easy, right? Ooh, that was a hard fight. Uh, before I got there, people on my team said told me they had raised concerns about the top five for months, but nobody was listening to them. And I was like, hey, don't worry about it. I'm a VP. Don't listen to me. Nope, not in any way. So sometimes, uh, if you find that you're really not being listened to, it can help to bring someone really expensive in to say the same thing as you. So I did one better. I brought in two really expensive people to say the same thing as me. I, I got together with my boss, and we brought in two fantastic consultants, uh, Lara and Deepa. And one of the first things they said to us was, have you thought about ending the top five? And I was like, yeah, 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 we have thought about that. And finally, like with, with that outside pushing, we finally managed to get it done. And one of the th things I learned, well, in hindsight, I really wish I had brought them in more quickly. I resisted bringing in consultants because I thought I could see so clearly what had to change. I didn't need them to tell me what to change, but I really needed some outside help to get the change done. It actually doesn't matter if you can see what needs to be changed really clearly. If you can't get the change done, it really does not help your team. So, in conclusion, the next time someone comes to you and says, how do we instill a sense of urgency onto the team? Here are a few things to bear in mind. I'm a big believer that you get what you measure. So look hard at what your incentives and your penalties are. I like to ask myself, uh, what is the worst way someone could interpret this? Think like the top five. If you're pushing your teams to release quickly, but with no balancing metric, like number of bugs in production, uh, that may not go the way that you want. Safety is hugely motivational, but usually not in the way that you want. Uh, so what happens when something goes wrong? Do you blame teams? Do you blame engineers? Do people have the skills they need to be successful? Is the path to promotion clear? Do you have a skills matrix? Like, do you know what it means to be a senior engineer? How much control do teams have over what they do? Do teams have autonomy in solving their own problems? Do teams have ownership over their code and production? Do teams know why they're working on things? Can they draw a straight line from what they're working on to company problems? Questions?
Thank you so much, Lisa. We've got about five minutes for questions um, before lunch. So has anybody got a question for Lisa? If you find the uh, mics intimidating, somebody's going to roam around with one. So I think there's one down here. Oh, also, my company is hiring. If you happen to be in New York, come join me. Um, so you mentioned uh, the process of uh, Namawashi gaining, yep. uh, leaning the foundation for support uh, for a change. How do you balance the time spent on that uh, versus time spent on uh, executing on things that are more directly, um, more directly visible um, versus this sort of kind of hidden thing for a while until oh hey it then has this benefit. Oh, that, that's a good question. Especially as an individual contributor. So for me, I would use Namawashi if there is something really big that I want to do to a team that I think is really important, but I can see that there's probably going to be some resistance to that idea. So at Bauer, like it was crucial to have some kind of performance review process and smart goals so we could actually track performance going forwards. They never had that before, so it's quite scary to that team. So I wouldn't do it for everything. It's really... For me, it would be like the things that you are most important to get right that you suspect would be hard. If, if, if there's something that you're doing, eh, it doesn't matter so much if it works or not. Don't worry about that one. Any other questions? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so. I guess the, my question is around when you have you know, business leaders asking, you know, instill a sense of urgency, mm -hmm. how do you manage their expectation that if you are you know, making the change in the practices and such, that you, they will see the result? Because often what I find is that business leaders want to see those improvements fast, and sometimes some of the practices doesn't come into play until a bit later, like you say, that you know, sometimes it gets worse <laughs> because it gets better. And how, how have you sold that uh, previously? You've got any experience in that? Yeah, so it, it's true. Often if you're doing things, uh, example, like shifting to pairing when they haven't paired before, the, the short term is that velocity can go down rather than up, and it can be quite scary to senior folks. One thing that I always try to do when I join a new company is like have a quick win. That is like figure out something that the team wants and that management wants you can introduce pretty quickly, like to get everyone on side uh, before, you, before you do like the, the long, hard things of changing a team. So like for Bauer, that was a safety thing of just saying people didn't have to finish stories by the end of every sprint. That was a really quick change. And management could see the engineers stopped hiding around the building. So that was like pretty much instant, like getting trust from management. And then you do the harder things, which is like, well, the next thing is going to take a while, but like, bear with me, I promise something is going to happen. Velocity will get better later on. But I think the same thing for both management and for engineers. Like, find something that everyone wants so you can like, demonstrate success early on, so you have the credibility of doing the longer, harder things later on. Does that help? Hi, um, just a quick question about skill matrix. Uh, because um, I understand you do plot your engineers on the skill matrix with the engineers, but um, do you keep that information public? Uh, the, the skills matrix, that one is not public. I think the meetup one will be. There are a bunch of them that are public. Like Rent the One Way is like the classic example. If you Google Rent the One Way, that one's completely public. Some of the meetup things are public, some are not. Um, that one that I showed you isn't. I tend to take them with me when I leave a company. Uh, if I ever could, I would love to make them public because I think they're, they're a great resource to share with everybody. And the follow-up question here, uh, if that's all right. Um, sure. Also, there, sorry, there, there's something else. There, there's a resource. I forget what it's called. Yeah. But someone has literally collated all of them. Like someone's got like, pretty much every open skills matrix on the internet and put it in one place. Uh, I think someone, someone over here knows what it's called. Uh, I'll just stand up. Uh, it's called progression.fyi. Progression.fyi, like go to that one. It's got a ton of like helpful skills matrices. Matrices is a good place to start for your team. And um, uh, do engineers know what other, how other engineers in the team are plotted in that matrix with detail? So everyone knows everyone's title. They don't know anyone else's performance other than that. So if someone is not performing, that's not visible. That's a conversation between them and their manager. Everyone knows their title. I also like to do open salary bands for me. So you know everyone's title, a title maps to a salary band. So you know if someone is a senior engineer, they make between this and this. So that, that much is public to everybody. 
just as we're getting into a really interesting discussion <laughs> on transparency, we've got to end it there. Um, we're, it's time for lunch now. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Lisa and also that lots of people have this morning have talked about trust and the next session after the break is looking specifically at trust. So join us back after the lunch uh, in this room. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you.